Travel photography is an incredibly exciting and fulfilling genre of photography, as it's both a documentary and an artistic recording of your favorite vacation trip memories. In this video, you'll discover three distinct phases of successful travel photography. What to do to prepare for your vacation or photo trip, what to do when you have arrived at your location and start shooting, and best practices for working with your photos at the end of the day when you're back at your hotel or your accommodation. The real benefit of learning how to create great travel photos is that you can sort of seal up your memories to be enjoyed by future generations. But this video is not about boring photos of famous landmarks. This video is about infusing art and a lot of creativity into your travel photos. You want to keep your viewers on the edge of their seat instead of yawning. With these tips and techniques, you'll be sure to have a captive audience. So let's first begin this tutorial with what I call pre-trip preparations. The better prepared you are, the more fun you're going to have on your travels and the better photographic results. Okay, the first tip is very obvious, but it's so important. Do some research, go on Google, Check out the place that you're going to, find the local attitudes toward photography. And also a really interesting tip is to go on to Instagram and do a hashtag on the location that you're going to. You'll be able to see some really great photos and awesome locations. Now, many people ask me, what do I do about lenses? Well, here's the problem. If you have a lot of lenses in your bag, it takes a lot of time to take them off, put them on, and you might miss your shot. When you're doing travel photography, it's nice to have one lens with a good zoom range. Take a look at this Canon. It's an 18 millimeter to 135 millimeter zoom. This will cover me for pretty much any wide angle scene, like maybe a landscape or architecture inside a church. And it'll cover me for any telephoto scene where I want to zoom in on a far distant uh, horizon or Maybe I see uh, wildlife that I want to zoom into. So this type of lens, it's an all-in-one zoom. It's really good for travel photography and it'll cut down on weight and it's very efficient. Now with regards to what type of camera body you should have, just use the one that you already have. There's no need for you to go out and buy a new camera for travel photography. However, if you're currently in the market to buy a new camera, I do suggest a smaller lightweight mirrorless design, something like Fuji or Sony or Olympus. Uh, really good for travel photography because it's so light, so easy to use. Now with regards to tripods, a lot of people like them, a lot of people don't. However, if you are a person who wants to take one and you want to still have light weight on your back, this is the type. It's a travel tripod and it's good for carrying on airplanes. This particular one is by Mi Photo and it goes with me pretty much everywhere I travel. Now, depending on how much gear you have on your travels, you may be able to get away with what we call a sling bag for your camera. And I'm able to use something really small like this when I'm going around with a small mirrorless camera. However, if you have a DSLR with larger lenses and you actually have to carry more gear, then a DSLR style bag, of course, is something that you'll want to invest in. And the nice thing about these is they have partitions where you can put your lenses, your cameras, and pretty much anything else you'll need for your travels. Now, a little safety precaution that I use, which is kind of funny actually, is I pack a fake wallet and an expired passport. So I'll put $20 and some uh, useless cards uh, just in case uh, there's a pickpocket and uh, with my uh, passport that's no longer usable, I'm pretty much covered. Fortunately, it's never been needed, but it's a precaution that I sometimes take. Now, with regards to memory cards, usually someone will buy a really large memory card and just take one, but I suggest instead that you take two or even more memory cards, even if they're a little bit smaller in size. If one card breaks or is damaged, then you have the other one to fall back on. Also, after your day's done, you're done photographing, having an external hard drive is really useful to back up daily uh, your photos because it's really important to keep them safe. Something small like this is good and lightweight, really great for travel. Now I've heard many horror stories where people have been out in far distant places, they run out of battery or they lost their battery. That's terrible news. That's why I suggest you bring two chargers, multiple batteries and put them in different suitcases. If you have all of your batteries in one suitcase and that suitcase gets lost at the airport, 
that's bad news. Separate them and you'll be all set. Now, what do you do with those precious photos at the end of the day? Well, if you have a computer and you're able to download your photos, a card reader is a very useful device because you just plug your card in and that's how you download your photos into your computer. However, what I suggest as well, in case this breaks and you can't go to the store to buy a new one, is in most cameras when you buy them, you'll find a USB cable. And this goes from directly into your camera to your computer to allow you to transfer photos without a card reader. Now, when you're at the end of the day and you're ready to download your photos, uh, it's nice to have a lightweight device to carry around, like a MacBook, MacBook Air, an iPad, or a tablet. The smaller and lighter, actually the better, because you want to travel light, but still have the ability to download those wonderful photos. Now, with regards to a very simple administrative tip, whenever I travel, I always take a photocopy of my passport and any specific cards that are important. And one photocopy goes to a family member back home, another photocopy goes in my suitcase. Just in case I lose these, I will be all set. Okay, now we're all set to go travel. Let's go outside and have some fun. Okay, I'm ready to do some really fun travel photography. Now, because I don't know anything about this city, I hired a local guide. Come on in here, Arenas. And he's gonna help me find some awesome shots and especially cool locations like this amazing local market. Okay, now you may not need to hire a local guide. But if you're together with a friend or family members or with a tour group, then it's not an issue. However, it will give you far more efficiency by getting someone local to show you the really cool sites. Okay, with my really great sling backpack here for my camera, I'm gonna get the camera out. And we're gonna start shooting. But first, I want to explain certain uh, settings that you'll need for photographing in environments like this. For example, I'd like you to go to Aperture Priority, which I think is the best mode for travel photography. Also, keep in mind that when you're photographing travel situations, you don't want too much background blur. A little bit is okay. You especially want sharpness of the faces if they're people you're photographing. So I advise F5.6. It's sort of a middle ground between F8 and your lowest F-stop number. Now, as you can see, the light in here is a little bit uh, challenging. There's daylight coming from the windows and there's artificial light coming from the stalls. So what do you do in that situation? Well, in white balance, I suggest this time you switch to auto white balance. So that's what I'm gonna do on my camera. And this will help me sort of get a good average white balance when I'm photographing in various places in this environment. Okay, now my last tip before I start shooting, ISO. Because we're inside an environment that can be a little bit dark, you may need to increase your ISO. I advise you to try 400, 800, you may need 1600, but I'm not sure, depending on the light. So I'm gonna switch my camera to an ISO of 800, which should give me a fast enough shutter speed to take great sharp photos. Okay, let's take some shots. Okay, now I'm outside of the market. I love being in the environment of the people when I'm traveling and just seeing how they live, how they work, and being uh, just amongst all this energy. So what do you need to do to change your settings? We just were from the inside, now we're out. What I'd like you to do is lower your ISO. Because it's bright outside, we don't need the high ISO. 100 or 200 is fine. Unless, of course, it's getting dark out, then you'll want to increase it. Also. Let's change the white balance. Because it's daylight, you can use daylight white balance, or to warm up your picture, try cloudy. That's a really good way to give you a little bit of warmth. Okay, now I love photographing early in the morning. It avoids the tourists, and you really get to see the locals going about doing their normal work. Also, evening is great because of that warm, rich light. Keep in mind, when you're doing travel photography, and you really do want to get a picture of that iconic church, or that historical monument. Try to do it in a way that is not particularly textbook. What I'm thinking is, don't be afraid of deep shadows. Don't be afraid of, of uh, changing the angle where you photograph. Maybe you're gonna go down on the ground or try an aerial view from 
some higher up location. Try to switch it up so it doesn't look like every other photo taken by every other person. Now one thing to keep in mind is some situations you may be in a position where a security guard or an authority doesn't want you to photograph. Well, just smile, apologize, and walk away, and everything should be fine. Okay, we're done with the photo shoot session of this great city and this great market. Now I'm gonna go back to my hotel room and let's do some downloading. Okay, I'm back at my hotel room. I had an awesome day of travel photography. Now, now that I'm back here, what I want to do is download my cards into my computer. If you have a backup service, a cloud-based service like iCloud, Dropbox, or Amazon, what you can do is keep your photos safe and protected by letting them go up to the cloud overnight. This is something I do and it works really well. Now, if you don't have a fast internet and if you don't have a cloud service, that's okay. If you did bring along a little external hard drive, just download your photos to the hard drive and keep it in the hotel safe. That means that all your photos will be guaranteed to be good and safe for when you return home. Okay, let me recap what you learned in this video. There are three phases to travel photography. One is the planning. The second phase is actual on the ground shooting what kind of settings you need to do when you're inside and outside photographing the local environment. Also, what do you do for backup when you're back at your hotel? All these three things will help you get amazing travel photos and I'm really excited to see what you can do. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you got a lot of value out of it. Now, there's so much more I'd like to tell you about digital photography. And while I didn't hold anything back, there's only so much I could really share with you in such a short video. And that's why I've recorded an entire video course about incredible photos with your digital camera. So if you'd like to find out more about my digital photography course, you'll find more information right under this video. So take a look at my full digital photography course, and I hope to see you there.